So, uh, hi everyone, welcome to the next extremal and probabilistic webinar. Uh, our today's speaker is Hong Liu from University of Warwick. Uh, and he is going to uh, talk about high dimensional geometric construction for uh, Ramsey Turan theory. And before I uh, pass the talking stick to Hong, just uh, let me say a few things in case you are here maybe for the first time. So this webinar is, is being recorded. So in particular, uh, if you don't wanna leave any recordable trace uh, on the internet, well, don't uh, don't send out any any data. But after the talk will be over, and there will be a there will be a part for the, the the questions after the talk. We will stop the recording, and we will also have some informal, uh, unrecorded chat with Hong Emma and, and chat with Hong and others. So, uh, in case you want to ask any question, but you don't want to leave any recorded trace, then uh, I suggest you wait for that time. And re 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 regarding the questions, one more thing. So during the talk, feel free to uh, post any question inside the chat. Oftenly what happens is that somebody, so someone else from the audience answers your question right away. But in case it, in case it's not gonna happen, uh, either Hong will address the question or I will let him know that there is a question to, to answer. Anyways, so I hope I haven't forgotten anything important and yeah, okay, Hong, the virtual stage is yours now. Thank you, Hong. So thanks for um, the invitation. I'm glad to be here. So uh, I'm gonna talk about a type of problem called ramsey turan problem. It's also one of the first type of problems I have encountered in extreme graph theory. So this is joint work with uh, Christian Ryer, Marianne Charizardet, and Catherine Staden. So I will start by um, give you some motivation of, of the birth of this theory. So um, just to be on the same page, we know that Ramsey's theory essentially says that the complete chaos is impossible. So formally in the graph uh, language, if you two color a sufficient large complete graph, the edges, then you will see a large monochromatic click. And uh, people tend to believe that the Ramsey graph, the extremal graph, they tend to be random-like, okay? And on the other hand, the other very classical problem, the Turan type problem, in particular, Turan's theorem, what does he say? He asks for the maximum number of edges a graph can have given the number of vertices. Uh, suppose it doesn't have a fixed size clique, how many edges you can have. So for example, if you have K4 free, let me just give you an example, and M vertex, then Turan's theorem says that in order to maximize the number of edges, the best we can do is to, uh, to partition the vertex into three parts and leave each part empty and put the complete bipartite graph be between parts, okay? This later is called a Turan graph. So if you look at this graph, the extremal graph, this, it's a, on the other end of the spectrum, it's highly structured graph, highly structured, unlike the Ramsey. So now the question is, can we somehow combine these two, and this was uh, this was indeed uh, introduced first by Shosh in 1969, and later generalized by uh, by Erdish, Heino, Shosh, and Samaridi in 1983. So, so to state the formal definition, I need to write down one more notation. For integer p, I will write alpha p of g to be the p independence number of the graph, okay? p 
the independence number. What is, what is it defined? This to be the max size subset that induce a KP free graph, okay? So in particular, if you take little p to be two, uh, we recover the, uh, the classical independence number. Okay. Um, yeah, any stage, uh, if you have any question, please let me know. After dividing this, now we can formally define the ramsey turan number. Given p and another integer q and another integer m. What is this definition? This is the maximum number of edges in an m vertex graph g satisfying the condition that first of all is kq free as in the Turan's theorem. But the twist is that we additionally assume it has small p independence number. We require the alpha p of g to be at most m. So some remark I have to make here, uh, by Ramsey theorem, we know that this definition is only meaningful uh, if, if m is a function of n, when n goes to infinity. Otherwise, uh, we can easily find one of these forbidden graphs. And uh, since, um, since introduced in the 60s, uh, there are some many questions turns out to be able to, we can freeze a lot of questions in terms of this uh, notation. And for example, it has been used, some, uh, some cases of this ramsey turan number has been used in the construction of dense sit-on sets, infinite sit-on sets. And it was also used uh, to, to dispute the geometry problem, the Hill, Hill bronze problem, which asks for, you have endpoints on the unit uh, square, then how small can the, the area of the triangle determined by the three point B, okay? So today I, I will not talk about uh, I will mostly focus on the very classical case. That is when m equal to little o of n, okay? Today, I will focus on m equal to little o of n. Uh, this is perhaps one of the original motivation of this notation. So if we come back to the Turan's theorem, we have, for example, this K4 free complete tripartite graph by highly structured, in particular, you can see that there's a linear size independent set here and here and here, right? Now, um, one can ask if we don't have a linear size independent set, what will happen? Can you still guarantee a dense graph? You still have lots of edges. So here, this is precisely when M equals to little o of N, okay? To, for, to forbid this kind of uh, two run graph to appear then what can you say? This is when uh, P equal to two, for example, or, or any P here, because independent set is also a KP independent set. Okay. Formally, let me give a formal definition. Um, we define the Ramsey Turan density. What do I mean by little of N? This Ramsey Turan density is defined to be, we look at the ramsey turan number of n, uh, we for bkq in the graph, and we require the p independence number to be smaller than epsilon n. Then we normalize by the total number of pairs, take the limit goes to infinity, then you will have a function of epsilon will appear in there. Now we take epsilon goes to zero. Okay, it can be shown that the, this limit indeed exists. And by sublinear case, we just mean that this is this density times 
and choose 2 plus some little o n square. OK? So it looks a bit technical. Let me give you some examples. Let's look at the simplest case. By Turan theorem, we know that what is the simple case, which is Mantel's theorem, the triangle, OK? K3. In this case, what we can do is the, max, the maximizer is the complete bipartite graph. But if you look at the ramsey turan number of the triangle, requiring that um, here, if I don't write any subscript, I automatically assume that p equals to 2. OK? Now, if we assume the independence number has to be le sublinear, can the graph be dense? And this is a simple exercise to show that uh, the answer is negative, simply because the maximum degree, if you look at any vertex, if you look at its neighborhood, the maximum degree has to be sublinear. Because if the maximum degree is linear, by the independence number is sublinear, we will know that you will see an edge. If the degree is linear. Okay? If you see an edge, then we will get a triangle, which is forbidden at the first place. So it has to be, uh, so for this particular case, the edge density dropped from one half all the way to zero. The graph cannot be dense. So let's look at another example, K5. Okay? Here, in Turan's theorem, you do something like that. Okay? Complete four part tight. And you can compute the density easily. Now, how can we, I will tell you the answer directly for K5, sublinear case. It turns out that the density is roughly one half. So roughly n squared over four plus little n squared. What we can do is that for the lower bound, I'll give you the lower bound. We put also complete by product graph. Now what we do is to insert in each part a graph constructed by Erdős using probabilistic method, a graph with high girth and high chromatic number, then you can convert it to a graph to be, uh, to have sublinear independence number, okay? And triangle free because of the high girth. Now what happens is both sides triangle free, the best you can do is grab an edge from both sides. So the largest click you can obtain is K4. So this graph is K5 free. An upper bound is not so hard to prove. So after Shosh introduced this, uh, in one year later in 1970, Erdős and Shosh were able to generalize this up the two little cases that I showed you before, right, right here, to all odd click, showing that if you look at the independence number case, p equal to two, and you look at click of odd size, 2t plus one, they determine the density to be this quantity, okay? So now you may wonder what happened to K4? Why I deliberately uh, leave out this particular case? As it turns out, K4, the even click, the problem becomes a lot harder, okay? So let me spend some time to talk about the K4 case. The Ramsey Turan number for K4. Okay, so once again, let's recall the definition. What do we want? We want to know if a graph does not have K4, a four click, and the independence number is sublinear, how many edges it can have. For the even click, in 1973, uh, Samaradi used a prototype of a regularity lemma to give an upper bound on this K4 problem, the ramsey turan problem, okay? He proved in particular that this is at most n squared over a plus little o of n squared, okay? Let me write in this density language. So the K4 density for normal independence number p equal to two is at most one over four normalized by n squared of choose two. Now, if we pause for a moment, a priori, it is not clear at all if this density is positive, okay? 
let's maybe give a try to, cons to give a lower bound. In fact, by many, it was suspected that maybe row 204 is zero, perhaps, okay? This suspicion is not out of nowhere because if we think about it, what does it mean to have positive density? If it has positive density, hit it, the graph with regularity lemma, then you must find the cluster that's relatively dense there and pseudo-random. Okay, now if you look at this regular pair, and what we have to do now is to make sure that we have to destroy this linear size independent set. So that means we have to put some edge in there to make the independence number to be sublinear. Now, because of this regularity here, this is quite pseudo random going between, it's really hard to imagine how we can put edges inside to make it uh, K4 free. And meanwhile, to kill the linear independence number, okay? But then, um, so it comes as a surprise, a couple of years later, Bolobash and Erdős uh, construct a matching lower bound. In fact, not just proving that uh, a dense such graph exists, but they provide a construction matched to this density one quarter, okay? So this is nowadays so-called Bolobash graph. Bolobash Erdős graph, sorry. In particular, it shows that row 204 is at least one quarter. So matching to the to the uh, upper bound given by Samarati. So um, maybe I want to uh, talk briefly about this construction. This was the, the first construction using high dimensional geometric, high dimensional unit sphere uh, for this ramsey turan theory. So very roughly what they do is the following. The graph is largely bipartite. So consider two parts, you have A and B. Each take half of the almost equal partitions, say they take half of the vertices. Now imagine A and B to be a copy of high dimensional sphere, okay? I have to describe the inner edges and the cross edges. First of all, from the inner edges, A and B is isomorphic. Okay, so I'm gonna describe one side, the other side you're sticking the same graph. What you do is you put in a so-called Borsuk graph, a discre discretized version of it. So you, you uniformly distribute n over two vertices over this high dimensional sphere, okay, over B. Now for every vertex on this sphere, what we do is we make it adjacent to points that are almost antipodal to, to it. In other words, if this is a unit sphere, then we, we make X and Y adjacent if the distance between X and Y is almost two minus some small epsilon, okay? This is what you do for edges inside the part I set. What about the edges going across? For, going, for edges going across, I'll use the blue color, the cross edges. Now um, we have a, another vertex Z here, when is Z adjacent to X, say? We imagine Z live on the same uh, high dimensional sphere as, as X and Y. So you translate it here. Now X and Z is adjacent if or only if, if you look at X and you draw this hemisphere center at X and Z is like, is on the same hemisphere uh, center the x, okay? Geometrically, you can say the distance between x and z is uh, smaller than square root two minus some epsilon prime, a different epsilon, okay. or maybe maybe the same, okay? Anyway, so this is the whole construction. So let me briefly explain, convince you that this is the graph we want. So what do we have to see? What property do we have to show? We have to show that first of all, this guy do have independence number sublinear. And second of all, this graph is indeed K4 free. The edge density is quite easy to see. 
Because what happened is the red edges, they have very low density. So forget about it. Look at the cross blue edges. Every vertex is roughly adjacent to half of the vertices on the other side because you're adjacent to everything living on your hemisphere, okay? So density, you get one quarter density normalized by interest two. Why is the independence number sublinear? Let's grab a, a set of vertices of linear size. So that correspond to a, a set of positive measure living on the high dimensional sphere. Then by isoperimetric inequality, we know that uh, the diameter is minimized when you take a spherical cap of the same measure, okay? Because of this concentration of measure on the high dimensional sphere, if you take a positive measure uh, spherical cap, then you know that there must, the diameter is close to two. You must be able to find two points that are almost antipodal. But then what does that mean? That means that uh, we have an edge X and Y because they are antipodal, okay? This, is, this roughly explains why the uh, independence number must be sublinear. Now the K4 freeness is also very beautiful uh, geometric uh, intuition, simply because if we have K4, if you look at one side, the red graph inside, this has very high odd girth because edges, they are bouncing back and forth. It takes a long while to get off cycle, okay? So that means to get K4, you have to put two edges on, on two sides and hope that they are completely joined in between. You have to hope that it looks something like this. You have x, y here, you have x prime, y prime here. Okay, and hope that they are uh, completely joined. And turns out this is impossible simply because if you look at this x and y, they are almost antipodal. And x prime, y prime, they are also almost antipodal to be able to be adjacent inside. Now, simply because if you put this two stick of length, uh, what is it, two, then one of these side must be, at least one side must be longer than square root minus some little old one, okay? Then that means what? You, it's impossible to make all four sides to be slightly short of square root two, okay? So that means one pair of this cross pair is not adjacent. That's roughly the proof. So now, um, eventually in 1983, in this paper by Erdős, uh, sorry, Heino, Shosh, and Samaradi, they resolve the remaining case cases for even cycle. Uh, even click, they prove that the, the Ramsey Turan density for p equal to two, the independence number case is some number like this, okay? This number doesn't mean anything. I just write it here for completeness. But let me show you the, the structural statement they prove, which is more informatic, okay? So what they actually be able to prove apart from these dry numbers are the following. They show that if you look at This Ramsey Turan density for the very normal, for the baby case when p equal to two, independence number is sublinear, and you forbid the click kq. The, the extremal, the uh, approximate minimizer has to be certain periodic behavior. Uh, here, there's a question. Miss, does epsilon prime need to be chosen carefully in terms of epsilon? for the K4 free to work out? Yes, you have to be careful. I believe they are the same. You can choose this epsilon prime equals to epsilon, okay? Yeah, and then you, you have to do some calculation. Yes. I was just trying to be safe, so I use different letters. So, um, okay. So they're able to uh, resolve the remaining even clip. And actually what they, what they observe is that this approximate minimizer the, or asymptotic extremal graph 
uh, exhibit certain periodic behavior. Okay, let me explain what it means. Uh, do I have time to write it down? Yeah, okay. Just to save some time, instead of writing down the formal statement, let me just draw pictures to show you what it means by uh, periodic. So you look at R2 of Q, we start with R2, 3, R2, 4, R2, 5, right? Remember that this equal to zero. And uh, this is one over four, this is one half. Okay. So the periodic behavior, this is what I mean. When k equal to three, you know that you cannot have density. So I skip this case. The next case, for the k4 free sublinear independence number, upper bound by Samaradi, lower bound by Bolo bach erdich graph, they show that what you can do is you put some uh, sublinear independence number graph in here. Okay, and then, I, this is not what I want. <laughs> you put some uh, graph, sparse graph inside the inner parts to make it to have sublinear independence number. Now, cross edges, you put density one half. Which happens to be one over P, right? P is two here, one half. Now, when it becomes K5, what you do is you make it complete by part type. Now the density becomes one or two over two, right? Is this necessary? <laughs> okay. So, and then you put some uh, sublinear independence number graph inside parts to kill the linear independence, uh, sublinear independence number condition. Then what happened to six? You come back to this one half Borubash Erdish graph, and then you stick one complete part, make it completely join to the previous one. Okay, it's evolving like this for six for k six, and then you can optimize the part to calculate the density, which turns out to match to this number here. Then, as you might already guess, what about seven? The seven is we're going to grow this purple part into density one again. This is what I mean by periodic. So for seven, you make it completely one, one, one. Okay. For I will draw, I will draw one more. For eight, you add one more part, but now you have to make one part to be of density one half, while the other part has density one. So every time you start with a bolovash erdish graph with density one half, and whenever you have to uh, the crease size, the Q increase by one, you change this to density one. If you cannot already density one, then you attach a new part and drop it down to density one half and you evolve like that. Okay. Now I want to talk about, keep this picture in mind. Uh, this motivates this uh, one of the main uh, conjecture in this area, which is for the general case when P equal to three. Uh, P equal to general number, okay. So recall, this is the density for KQ free graph with sublinear P independence number, okay. So what they conjecture by Erdős, Heino, Shimonovich, and uh, Shosh, and Samaradi, what they conjecture is that, um, so what happened is in the 83 paper, uh, they cannot determine, they give an upper bound of one over six and lower bound they cannot determine, okay? And when you cannot do a problem, usually what, what we usually do is to make it harder. So <laughs> they conjecture this very bold one. 
suspecting that for the general case, rho PQ, he also behave like this, evolving by, uh, periodically. So what I mean is the following. For general case, rho PQ evolve as in P equal to K, P equal to two case periodically. Okay. I'm running a little bit slow, so let me just write very briefly. So what do I mean by this? Instead of writing the general case, let me just focus on P equal to three, the next baby case. This is uh, with a big KQ, a clique of order Q, and we require that whenever you take a linear size set of vertices in N, we have to see a triangle, right? The triangle independence number is sublinear. For this case, they believe that, well, it's not hard to show that the row three or four is zero. This is the same proof as row two of three is zero. Okay, so I will not talk about it. Now, if you look at K53 with a uh, triangle independence number sublinear, they conjecture that the independence, uh, the extremal graph, it looks something like this you have some density one third going in between two parts. And inside you're sticking some graph that is sparse and has sublinear triangle independence number. This, this kind of graph exists. For example, you can take this Erdős roger graph where they study, uh, you can put in here, K4 free graph with triangle independence number sublinear, okay? Such graph, it looks like two contradicting uh, requirement. On one hand, you don't have K4. On the other hand, you are very rich in triangle, but this graph do exist, proved by Erdős and Roger. You stick in there, then uh, what's going on? Uh, yeah, now you see the best you can do on both sides is to you grab a triangle, but then how do you put some edges in between such that the triangle on both sides don't create a K5. It looks like we might be able to even create a K6. So it's not clear at all whether the row three or five or row three or six is po has positive density or not. So we encounter the same kind of difficulty as the four click in the standard cases when P equal to two. So they conjecture that this periodic behavior look like this. You have for five, you have a pair, you're sticking early Schroger graph, you make it density, you have density one third going between. And for six, then as you might guess, let me use another color, then you put some graph that has density two third, okay? Which is two over P. This is one over P. Then for seven, Seven is, is proved, actually. This is a very special case we do know. You make it density one. So you see the density become from one over P, two over P, all the way go to one. So what do you do when you reach one and the Q keeps increasing? We attach new part and make one pair drop down to one over P, start from there and evolve again. Namely, if you look at this row three A case, now we, by part of the case, grow to the full density one. We make three parts, one part of density one third, the other part, complete part tight. Okay. And for nine, I will draw one more. You just make this one part grow denser to two third. And you might guess row 310, you make this blue part into density one and you attach new part, so on and so forth. This uh, conjecture is very bold, but looks plausible as we're seeing for the P equal to two case. Okay. There's no reason to believe that uh, uh, we cannot construct such graphs. Any question about the statement? I, I didn't write it out formally, but uh, I hope you get the how they come up with this conjecture coming from the P equal to two case, okay? So right. maybe I have a quick one. So this one third, 
was there some some more uh, motivation for density one third yeah because for some small cases they can show that when you have density one third plus epsilon then such graph do not exist so the best you can do is one third for the small cases they can show this upper bound mm -hmm. i think uh, for sure they they work out row three five upper bound is one third there then row three six i'm not sure if they work out the upper bound then uh on top of my head, I cannot recall. Then boom, they, they come up with this very bold conjecture saying that it has to basically mimic what's going on for P equal to two. You, you evolve like that. Okay. So now if you think a little bit, this one third or, N, or Bolobash, basically when they raise this question, they uh, already suspect that it has to be some variation of this high uh, geometric construction they compute the uh, upper bound for K6. Okay, thanks, Yushi. Yeah, they also give the upper bound for K6 and also K5. So maybe that gives more supporting uh, evidence for this, for this both conjecture, okay? So um, I would like to actually mention the con our construction. So I will skip some history, uh, but let me mention one result since you, <laughs> is that this row 305 is not clear at all whether it should have positive density as the K4 case. But then about 10 years ago, uh, Yuji and John Lance, they gave uh, one of the very elegant construction showing that row 35, including many other infinitely many cases, uh, in particular when Q is P plus two, then you have positive edge density, which is not, not trivial at all a priori because um, this bolibash erdish graph, the lower bound construction come as a magic. So it's not clear whether we can extend it to the more general case, but they did it in that case. Okay. Now, um, the, this is the one main problem, major or conjecture there, very beautiful one, uh, anti anticipating this periodic behavior. The second main problem raised uh, in the 83 paper by Erdish, Haino, Shumanovich, and Samaradi is problem B. They, they suspect that it has to be some geometric variation to be able to provide some lower bound for such conjecture. So they asked, can you build some variation of bolobash erdish graph with density or something other than one half going in between? Okay, for bolobash erdish graph, we have one half. So in all, can you get one third or any other density, basically? Construct bolobash erdish graph variation with density other than one half. This was partially addressed also by the aforementioned result of by Yushi and John Lance, they, their construction is a, a, some very magical product construction utilizing the bolobash erdish graph as a black box. Then uh, are they able to construct power of one half? Okay. So what's known in this direction? Is power of one half is possible. Um, there's also some sporadic problems they asked in various places. I will skip mentioning them. So uh, now I want to say what will our contribution. First of all, uh, uh, regarding this problem B, constructing a bolobash erdish graph with some variation of it with density other than one half, uh, we managed to address this problem to be to construct uh, a variation using complex high dimensional sphere, which gives all of density between two parts up to one half, all rational density. Okay, so this is the Christian. 
Marion and Catherine. Okay. So we uh, the formal statement is a little bit technical. So let me just write that uh, we have, uh, actually I can write it. I have um, M by, there exists the bipartite, not bipartite, sorry. M by M vertex graph, we have M vertices W and Z. Okay, such that this graph has P independence number sublinear as required. And uh, ah, I have to take L less than P, at least one. And uh, this graph is KP plus L plus one free. Okay, you don't have certain size click. And inside here, it's sparse. I'm not gonna write that. But what's important here is the cross edge density. The edge density going across W and Z equals to L over P minus theta over one. Now, if you recall the main conjecture that I mentioned before, this basically provides just a bit over half of the conjecture to lower bounds. For example, if you take P equal to three and L equal to one, you recover this row three, five case and it tells you that the density is one over three. So after almost 40 years, we are able to say that the upper bound provided by uh, them at the first place is the right upper bound. So for this, the first baby case that we cannot solve, first non-trivial case, uh, we have the density one third. So here you can take, uh, yeah, any, any L, as long as L less than P. So any rational density up to one half. So as a consequence, it basically shows that if you let Q to be PT plus L plus one, then for any L, up to half, if you look at the residue of Q modular P, you can provide the, the lower bound conjectured, okay, like that. We do have what's going on here in this picture for a bit over half of the cases. So There's a reason we cannot pull up of density one half, yeah. Honk, uh, should the row three five be one over six, if I'm not mistaken? Uh, I normalize by, uh, oh yeah, one over six, yes. Going across is uh, one, one third, then overall it's one over six, thanks. Right, okay. So yeah, L over P is the bipartite density. So it should be L over two P for the edge density. Um. Right, so we provide the lower bound as conjectured for a bit over half of the cases. I will tell you, I'll describe the construction briefly, uh, but let me just tell you, maybe give you some idea why we cannot push beyond one half. Uh, or maybe I will explain it later and after I say the construction, but let me now uh, the second result, we second type of construction we construct actually to our own surprise shows that this conjecture is not true in fact, okay? The result is also a bit technical to state it involves a lot of parameters, but let me just say that the smallest counter example we found to this periodic evolving conjecture. Okay, that I mentioned. The smallest we can find is when P equal to 16 and Q equal to 22. Okay, for this graph, what's the conjecture, the extremal graph? 
what you do is you, whenever this Q is less than twice of 16, they, they conjecture that it has to be almost bipartite. And you grow this density to, you put some graph in between with density, what's the density? 22 over 16. Mm, when it's five, you put one there. So it's five minus three, two minus one. Okay. So it should be five over 16. You put this density here. Okay. This is what they conjecture because row 16, 17 is zero. Very simple proof. Then they conjecture that if it's 18, you put one over 16. If it's 19, you put two over 16, dot, dot, dot grow to this case. For 22, it should be density five over 16 and keep going until you reach one, you attach new part. This is the growing part. And it turns out what we're able to prove is that uh, we construct a graph that's three part tight with density one quarter in between. Now, if you compute, this guy is strictly denser than that. Showing that, uh, the Ramsey-Turan density they conjectured for the general case, it's not true. There exists an example that's denser than what they conjectured. In a sense, what they conjecture is that when Q is less than 2P, then it should be mostly bipartite and start growing, the increasing the density of the set. What we prove is that not just this, when Q is less than 2P, the extreme example can be very different from bipartite. For example, here this is tripartite. Our general result shows that it can be T partite for any for infinite sequence of T when Q is less than 2P. So it's wrong in a very strong sense. The general problem is a lot more delicate than conjectured. Okay. So the extreme graph can be t part type, almost t part type for infinite many choice of t not just the bipartite case as they conjectured so uh, I think I have two, three minutes to describe the, our construction maybe very briefly. This complex Bolobach Erdich graph. Okay. So for a while, it was not clear to us, how do we get Bolobach Erdich graph with density other than one half? Because what happened if you recall that construction, the density is contributed by the cross edges. You make the vertex adjacent to a vertex from the other side, if you lie on the hemisphere centered around itself. Okay. So what, what happened is in this high dimensional sphere, uh, because of the concentration of measure, if you take a spherical cap from the hemisphere and you start you start lifting it to the North Pole, the measure drop drastically. You go from one half and suddenly it becomes a little of one. So uh, there's no way of taking like one third or I don't know, 0 0.48. Um, then it, we were suspecting that, okay, in, if you look at the real numbers you, or the sphere, you only have up and down the North hemisphere and South hemisphere. There's not really a way um, to take any number other than one half. Then we were suspecting that the, what if we use complex number, then you can utilize the angle to perhaps take measure of different numbers than one half. Um, it was not clear how to do it. Then uh, eventually we managed to make it work. So the graph looks like the following again, you have two parts, A and B, and each part is a, it's a unisphere in the 
uh, unit complex sphere of high dimension. Imagine k really, really large. Okay. Now we again distribute points uniformly over this high dimensional sphere. Okay. I will give you the example when p equal to three. We require alpha three of n g to be sublinear, meaning that whenever you take linear size sets of vertices, you must see a triangle. So what you do is I have to describe two graphs. The inner graph basically uh, for inner edges, you have two points x and y. You make x adjacent to y. So imagine this is a vector. Okay, living in the K high dimension. Uh, so we make X adjacent to Y if X and Y, if uh, row, ah, this. So what does it mean? This is the root of unity, one third root of unity. So you may ask adjacent to Y if their angle is roughly on the complex plane, okay? If you rotate it by pi over two pi over three, pi over two pi over three, yeah, two pi over three, okay? Then you make them adjacent and something like this, okay, X, Y, Z. Then uh, it's not too hard to show that if you take a set of positive measure, you must see a triangle, okay? What about the cross edges? For the cross edges, we made two vertices. We have X here and Z here. When do they adjacent? Now we actually don't have a geometric interpretation as in the Bolo Bash Erdish graph, you have these two stick of length one, then some cross pair must have length uh, smaller or bigger than square root two. We only have this uh, for cross edges. You have X adjacent to Z if the following holds two condition. A is that there exists uh, there exists uh, a rotation such that if you look at the imaginary part of this, the inner product of this two number is not so small. Some k times some small term, okay? Here, I have to say that I made this epsilon, okay? And second condition is that there exists some alpha rotation for this special case with oh this should be x times z a little bit technical basically if you look at the their inner product you get a complex number then uh, it's leaving in the first two pi over three chart this slice Okay, if you look at their inner product, it's somewhere here. So I want to end this talk by telling you why we cannot push it over density one half. Because if you look at this slice of pi, slide this chart, uh, one, two pi over three, whenever it has uh, angle less than pi, 
this is a convex set. When you go beyond pi angle, the set is not convex anymore. Then it's, uh, the convexity is very important in our proof to make everything work, okay? So I will end the talk here. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Hong, for a very nice talk. So I ask everyone uh, to unmute themselves and give Hong a round of applause for his talk. So uh, there is a question from Yoshi, which is similar to one I wanted to ask uh, in the chat. Uh, have you have you considered the hypergraph uh, Ramsey to Rand thing? So and Yoshi asked particularly about K K five uh, in the three uniform setting. Uh, we no, we we were just working on this uh, this conjecture. The, this one I stated here. So uh, we haven't thought of hypergraph. No. So I, I didn't mean the hypergraph question. I was just uh, <clears throat> checking if what you did for the small numbers like K35 or K36. Oh yeah, that yes. So basically it, we do prove that it should be something like this. Okay. So, so you, you get the one, uh, one six or one twelve or whatever. Uh... Right, yeah, up to the normalization. So the upper bound is tight, yes. So yeah, the, it's a bit technical. So I, I was trying to be not so technical. To summarize, our first result says that this periodic construction conjecture, uh, we do have this complex high dimensional sphere construction providing ha over half of the cases where they conjecture at lower bound. Okay. So give, give some merit to the con conjecture. But then our second construction shows that where they conjecture is in general very, very wrong because According to their conjecture, this, evolu this evolution takes when Q is less than 2P, it stays by part time and just bumping up the density, right? Here, one third, two third to one from five, six, seven. But what we show is that even when Q is at most 2P, it's not by part time. The uh, asymptotic uh, structure could be three part time, four part time for infinitely many choice of T part types. So the problem is a lot more complicated than than originally imagined, basically. Right. The other question is maybe it's not that uh, closely related, but uh, this Erdős and the other paper had a construction uh, which attempted to do something similar to you just in the real environment, playing with different angles, uh, which turned out to be incorrect. Uh, not because of them, they used the theorem, which was incorrect. Is there any similarity in some sense? I mean, that you are using complex numbers, so you are, uh, yours is definitely different, but is there any similarity between the two or? Uh, I, I wouldn't say so. I mean, in a sense, we, we are we're trying to re uh, think how to, how to generalize it, so we just, yeah, at the end, uh, we make it somehow work, but we lose this very elegant geometric, uh, this, this guy here, right? For the original B, BE graph, you have this very nice geometric explanation why it should be K4 free. But for our, we make it work, but it's some very technical, you see this kind of like condition on how things should lie, like what. We, we do have some nice pictures to give some explanation, but not as concise as, as this very simple picture here, as in the original construction. So. Sorry, one more question, sorry. Uh, but I mean, it's interesting results. So, uh, so the, the most of the upper bounds they have uh, coming from the regular dilemma. So you are proving matching upper bounds for them or? Yes, one thing I, I didn't have time to talk about is we also have 
result on upper bound. So what happened is you can use some regularity lemma to translate this kind of upper bound into a weighted two run type problem. So then this weighted two run type problem in a sense is a finite problem, it's a finite optimization, but we have no idea how to optimize it in general. But we do make some progress. Uh, for example, we have the matching upper bound. In general, we know when Q is one modular P. So we have an upper bound for when Q is two modular P for some small value of P. For example, when P equal to three or four, we can resolve the two modular case. The residue is two. And, uh, and also here, the counter example that we show for this, this tripartite one and also other T partite one, this lower bound, not just that it gives a density bigger than what they conjectured, but we also have a matching upper bound showing that in certain range of choices, this kind of uh, denser graph, they are actually asymptotically extreme. Do well. you think that your constructions are best possible and uh, there needs some progress on the weighted to run theory to probably prove that they are best possible or? Uh, I think that's a long story. In short, I don't think so. In short, we just discovered that the problem is a lot more complicated than we thought. At the beginning, we are actually rooting for this conjecture because it's so simple to state. See, I just, I didn't write anything. I just draw some pictures. It's very pretty to, to see involving like this. You know, initially we believed this one, but then later on, it turns out to be a lot more complicated. Now, actually, personally, I don't have a, even a conjecture uh, predicting what this general Ramsey to run density should be. I don't, I don't know what decides that. Yeah, yeah but Did I answer uh, your question? I, I'm not sure if I answer your question. So, so about the conjecture, uh, I mean, I, you, you were just sketching your construction, so I'm not 100% sure, but uh, uh, if Shimonovich usually says that uh, he doesn't care about the number, the conjecture is the structure, not the, not the number. So maybe they just meant to have something similar structure with this periodicity without optimizing? Uh, no, because if their periodicity periodicity conjecture is true, then you can you can do the opti the optimization optimization becomes a lot easier. Then you can oh. do the optimization by hand. I just didn't write down the number. So what we actually prove this counter example shows that if you if the periodicity is true, you optimize it, it still get beaten by this other multi partite graph rather than almost by partite ones. Okay, uh, I I have to look the paper if at one point you will post it. Uh, uh, so when I'm saying that I uh, you might uh, in Seoul you didn't give a counter example maybe I didn't try to belittle your result because your result is fantastic. So it's oh, I made people try to get this construction in the last fifty years. So it, and uh, so it's not. Uh, okay, and if you write down the details for the just for the construction, and how long is it? Or... Oh, probably it wouldn't be more than uh, just the construction. Just the construction. Uh, we have two type of construction. Probably together, it wouldn't be more than fifteen pages. It's not that long. Fifteen. Ten, oh, okay. Ten to fifteen, probably ten pages, maybe. Yeah, something like that. You mean just for the bipartite setup when you have like two classes or? Uh... Oh, for the complex case, we probably five, uh, six, seven pages like that. Something. Yeah. The Bolobash Erdos graph is just one page, but it's so dense. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, very nice. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so maybe let us all thanks Hong once again. Thanks. You unmute yourself. <laughs>